Hi, everyone. I have to start by saying I love that we do land acknowledgments now, but it also occurs to me that we could just, you know, give it back, the land. No? Oh, you're all in. We'll, we'll have to figure out how to do that next. Um, thank you, Madeira, for that overwhelming introduction. Thank you, Samantha and Shelby, for being your awesome selves. Thank you to Dean Pertle, Leela, Tara, Linda, and thanks to my wife, Rachel, for being my first reader. Thank you, Posse 10. It, it does my heart good to see you and your families here. I am so glad this finally got to happen, and an especial welcome and thank you to all the students, staff, and faculty who represent diversity here, no matter what kind. Let's take a moment to recognize the diversity within ourselves, what we call in gender studies the intersections, the cultures, the people, the ideas, the everything that we're made up of. Walt Whitman says he contains multitudes, and so do we. I'm what I refer to as a New York mutt, Polish, Italian, German, and Irish, but I've been educated by so many other people from remarkable cultures, from Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, to Ukraine, to West Africa, to India, to Chile. Jewish thinkers, Catholic theologians, Buddhist scholars, Sufi poets, Indian economists, agnostic skeptics, queer activists, working class writers, all of these too. I have been taught so many things by so many people, by so many kinds of people, and they are all in me. Yours are different than mine, and yours are different from the person sitting next to you. We are only a few hundred in person, but we're, we represent millions of lives, millions of experiences, so many knowledges, and we bring their stories, their lessons, their dances, their music and cuisines. Just cite your sources. <laughs> Credit the culture, the person, the scholar, the poet, the artist. Honor your ancestors, whether you know who they were or not. Thank your teachers for whatever kind of education you got from them, formal or informal. Now, two weeks ago, Anthony Mackey was here, and I'm certainly sorry I am not him <laughs> in so many ways. But he and I do have one thing in common. We're the, both the youngest of six. My grandmother was a janitor, my father a milkman, and like him and like many other working class people, I only managed to become a writer because my parents worked jobs they didn't love. I watched all of my older siblings take practical jobs, whether they became lawyers or accountants or CFOs. From a very young age, it was apparent I was the weirdo artist kid, bookish, and as my mom used to remind me, with a weird mix of chagrin and pride, I always marched to the beat of my own drummer. That doesn't come without compromise, but it does come with joy and with meaning. As a kid who had to stand up to bullies for my own self and on behalf of others, I learned not to trust groups. And as the teenager who supported my gay friends long before I understood my own queerness, strengthening and flexing that muscle, the one that says no to meanness, to injustice, to unfairness, became a regular habit. It may be the strongest muscle in my body for good or ill. And yet I wouldn't be here without my grandmother's tenacity. She single-handedly brought my last century immigrant family into the middle class because of her union job. Doing what needs to be done to pay the rent like she did and deciding when and how to loudly object to injustice is a dilemma you will all face. You will err in both directions, I promise. Forgive yourself in advance. Trying to sort out what kinds of decisions you can live with and which you can't is a lifelong process. The first time I addressed you as a group was that week in November 2016. That election had just happened. And yet I was co coincidentally delivering the first year studies lecture on Alison Bechdel's fun home for the whole of your class. So if I say three, two, one. Lesbians! <laughs> just like that. I remember researching where and when that book had been banned, and now, of course, it is in the whole state of Florida. So I'm thinking, because they've told us we can't say gay, maybe we can try that again, you know, just for Florida. Three, two, one. Yay! Awesome, thank you. <laughs> Amazing that stating a fact that the author wrote a graphic novel about coming out as a lesbian, amongst other things, is a problem for some people. 
I feel like we're having a really weird national conversation about facts right now and I don't really understand it. Like, racism is bad, gay people exist, trans people do too, women deserve to make their own medical decisions, stuff like that. The earth revolves around the sun, insisted Galileo, and you know that what happened to him because you read Brecht's play about him. It's almost like Plato was entirely correct in pointing out that insisting on dragging people out of the cave and into the light has consequences. You know I had to, right? It's been a long six, six years since you read those works and it might feel even longer than that. Time has become oddly complicated since COVID. We've all aged in immeasurable ways. We're all a little more exhausted and there's a lot fewer of us. I'd like to pause now for a moment to recognize the global millions we've lost to COVID in the past two years. Maybe that person was someone you knew. Maybe she's a friend of a friend. Maybe it was someone's parent or aunt, or maybe someone you only knew from a distance. I want to take another moment to recognize that tremendous grief. There is a grief too about what might have been, could have been, should have been, like this important ritual happening two years ago that you were tossed into adulting without celebrating in person. There is a grief for what COVID took away, that internship, that trip to Italy, that job, that apartment, that normal, that's gone forever now. I'm sure some of you have had moments of that feeling that things weren't supposed to be like this. You were supposed to get your spring term, the celebrations over those 10 weeks, and instead you were home with families and Zooming, your last classes, and while I know some of you just worked it out, others of you still might feel a little cheated and a little angry. It's okay, the world will do what it does. It's not only normal to grieve, it's vital. But as C.S. Lewis wrote in The Silver Chair, Crying is all right, in a way, while it lasts. But you have to stop sooner or later, and then you still have to decide what to do. Or, as my grandmother put it while looking at my brother who had moved back home and was kind of meandering in life, at some point you have to put on your pants and get out the door. <laughs> Odd premonition considering these years of pantless zooming. <laughs> She was a tough lady, the one who lived through the 1918 epidemic and who raised three children as a single mother in the 1930s. She missed exactly one day of work in her entire lifetime, and that was my sister's college graduation, the first in my family. Shout out to all the grands who are here, who support you, who love you, who helped finance your education. So aside from knowing that you have to decide what to do, what is there to do? What do you do in response to a global pandemic, structural racism, a bad SCOTUS decision that will claim lives? Climate change. Show up. Turn up. Turn out. Be heard from. My father plainly told us when we came out to him as LGBTQ, never let anyone treat you like a second class citizen. He was the one who taught me how to be anti-racist, who interfered with a white neighbor who followed a black man down our block and who snuck undocumented folks into the church late on Sundays so they could use the phone to get jobs. They have families, I remember him saying to my conservative brother, no human being is illegal. These are my sources, watch me cite them. But I want to take a minute to refocus. This is a story that I first heard as a Taoist lesson, but that I'm told by professors Vance and Kasser, it's nice having smart friends, is really pan-Asian. There's a man who owns a horse, who runs off into dangerous territory, and everyone says, oh, what bad luck, and he says, perhaps. And the horse returns with some new horse buddies, and everyone points out that's such great luck, and he says, perhaps. His son rides one of the wild horses and breaks his leg, and what bad luck, people say, and he says, perhaps. Some bad guys come from the dangerous territory and everyone gears up to go fight them, except the son whose leg is broken and people envy his good luck and he says, perhaps. Good news brings bad news, brings good news like an Ouroboros eating its own tail. That's another Bechdel reference. There's one more coming. 
It helps me, this story helps me in my frustrated moments from the personal when my wife doesn't get a huge role she's up for to the political when hate-driven violence happens. This is the world, this is the ride, and that story helps me regain my equilibrium, helps with the long view. As we say in New York, if you don't like the weather, wait a minute, because it will change. Everything will change, on a dime, when you're not expecting it, when you've got plans. Anthony Mackie pointed out, citing Mike Tyson, of all people, that everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. <laughs> I know you must hear how young and tenacious you are from olds all the time, but in your young 20s, you just make things look easy. It doesn't mean you're not plagued by doubt or imposter syndrome, that you're not worried about your student loans or whether you should go to grad school if you haven't or if you shouldn't have if you did. There's a lot to worry about on top of regular adulting, and at this particular time in history, adds layers of difficulty and complexity. See, the thing is, I think it's hard to keep coming up with new plans when you keep getting punched in the face. But you don't really have much of a choice, do you? Not really. New punch, new plan. Rinse and repeat. You are entering a world full of actual violence, so much of it full of hate. In the past few years, we've seen horrible acts of anti-Asian violence, anti-Semitic violence, anti-trans violence, anti-black violence, gun violence that goes unchecked, the war in Ukraine. And on top of all of that is the threat, the reality of climate change. It's a lot. And I really want you to know that it's a lot. There will be days when it's overwhelming, when you can't get your head around how tremendously bad things are. But the Talmud tells us do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. So let me talk for a minute about the work. Tikkun olam in Hebrew means something close to mending the world, the work of movements, of change, the work of social justice, of standing up, the work of making good trouble necessary trouble, as John Lewis called it the Lawrence commencement a few years back. The work is how you live in a world that doesn't make any sense, and although I know I have a reputation as an angry person, my wife says I'm the angriest person in the world, the truth of it is that that's not where the work sits in me. Yes, anger is an energy, as John Lydon once snarlingly intoned about the wretchedness of apartheid. Anger gets you started. I mean, how can any intelligent person look around at the world and not be horrified by the injustice? But it doesn't necessarily sustain you. What does? Focus, love, community, service, mutual aid. But the greatest of these is love, said Paul to the Corinthians. And so did Dr. King, reminding us that hate never drives out hate. Only love can do that. So did the late great bell hooks. So did all of my trans activist mentors. Love, love for the communities that know joy and suffering. Love for individuals, for family, for chosen family, for the people you understand the least especially. That's some hippie business you didn't expect from me. But it's true, now you know. Love and a deep suspicion of tradition will keep you sane. Cite your sources, not just because it's good academic practice and not doing so is an honor code violation, <laughs> but because it creates intellectual community, that great achievement of the liberal arts. But it goes way beyond that. Knowing who you are in the world helps contextualize your experience of life, whether it's your family history or the religions of your people, whether it's how you've built community and recognize kinds of joy. We are who we are, not just because we are autonomous, agentic people, but because we fit into systems, into communities. Sometimes when I'm teaching depressing information about sexism in STEM fields or trans employment discrimination or the way black girls are considered too loud by white teachers, a student will say, why are we learning this? And my answer once and forever is because knowledge is power. Saber es poder. Knowing you are up against it arms you to be prepared to find the people who will support you and inform you while you navigate this world and your career. And even if you are playing the game of life on the lowest difficulty setting, that citation goes to John Scalzi, it's good to know that you are. Discrimination, active or passive, macro or micro, ruins all of us. But white people, my fellow white people, please take stock. It is so much easier to own your privilege and use it for good, to walk humbly now, do justly now, love mercy now. 
Lead with compassion, work for justice, surround yourself with the people whose experiences and backgrounds and expertise challenge you. Knowing who you are helps explain how you are in the world, and it's a little easier to focus on the work, on mending what of the world you can, instead of losing yourself in the petty squabbles or celebrity gossip, or even that giant void that is your own insecurity. Remind yourself that money, power, and status are all to be handled with caution and as tools for the good of the world, maybe only coincidentally for your own. Be of service. Don't just look for the helpers, like Fred Rogers told us to do in times of great crisis, but be one. My mother had a sign up all through my childhood that said there are two lasting bequests you can give your children. One is roots and the other is wings. The source is unknown, but it's first attributed to an anonymous wise woman in a 1953 book. Your families, your friends, your ancestors, your Lawrence professors and staff have come to give you, have come together to give you both roots and wings. You stand on the shoulders of giants. Remember that you are a beautiful link in a long, long chain of people who worked, who suffered, who stood up or stood out. You are extraordinary, without peer, without malice. You know what the world is, you know how serious things are, and you know the world needs your brilliance and your light. Be bewildered by the beauty of honeybees, by a perfect sentence, by the stars. Eat a perfect peach. Reach for joy even when happiness isn't at hand. Astonish yourself. In closing, fight the power. That's Chuck D. <laughs> Vote in every election, no matter how small. Vote. Once more for fun, vote in every election, no matter how small. Trans rights are human rights, Slavic Ukraini, and cite your sources. In parting, a blessing from the Irish. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be at your back. And may you be in heaven a half hour before the devil knows you're dead. Solidarnest, go do all the things, class of 2020.